Okay, so let's get into it because I know you're all busy people. Um, so thanks for taking your time out today to come along to this session. We'll try and keep it snappy and informative for you. Um, so let's get straight into it by introduction to the Talos team. So next slide, please. So today you'll be hearing from James, who's our CEO. You'll also be hearing from Matt. Matt's our automation lead and tech guru, and he's the person that loves putting the robots into our clients for us. And myself, I'm the account manager to quite a lot of our RPA clients, and I'll also be the host for the day. So move on, moving on into the agenda. So what have we got going on today? Well, we're going to do a bit of scene setting for what RPA is and where the UiPath platform fits in. And then we're going to take you through some real life use cases from our lovely manufacturing clients. We'll also look at how you can make automation work for your business, including some practical tips and also insight into how our proven methodology EPIC fits in. Um, so we'll spend approximately 10 minutes on each area and we'll follow up with a Q&A session. So if you've got any questions, put them into chat and then we can go through them when we get to the end of the session. And now I'd like to hand over to James. So where we're going to kick off with is just an overview of what robotic process automation is. So RPA is, is the shorthand term for it. Um, and effectively, robots are, are software that can do a number of things that can support a business process. So one of the most remarkable capabilities of robotic process automation is that it can interact with computers exactly the same way that humans can do. So they can, um, <clears throat> they can mimic human interactions such as mouse clicks, keyboard inputs and navigating through applications and systems. Um, so what it means is that an RPA robot can effectively work seamlessly within, with existing interfaces without any complicated integrations or without any changes to those underlying systems. That's the very basic kind of capabilities of RPA. The next level up is performing some advanced co um, cognitive functions. So, you know, for example, RPA robots can read structured and unstructured test text documents, such as like email, invoices, contracts. Um, and by leveraging technologies such as optical character recognition and natural language processing, RPA bots can extract relevant information, make sense of it, and then perform some actions based on the data that it pulls out. In addition to emulating human interactions, robots can also talk in a kind of computer to computer way. So they can use things like the most common thing is um, APIs, application programming interfaces, which allow systems to talk to each other, sending and retrieving data backwards and forwards. So what this means is that RPA robots can work across multiple applications and systems, streamlining end-to-end -end processes. And it doesn't basically it doesn't matter if there is an API or is there isn't an API. The robot can interact with the system either in its kind of standard human way or it can interact with it in a computer kind of model. The other thing when they start getting really smart is that you know they can actually start making decisions based on data. So within any automation process, there's a workflow and there's obviously typical branches, you know, if certain conditions are met, go down one path, if certain other conditions are met, go down another path. And these can be data driven. And if you start getting into the more advanced capabilities, you can use things like machine learning to build models that will determine what's the right course of action given a complicated set of inputs. Um, so there's a lot of capability within robots to perform and I'll quickly recap to interact with human computers in the same way as humans do some of the cognitive functions that humans would do in a workflow. They can also do the computer to computer interactions as well, and they can perform part of your decision making or they can perform decisions on your behalf. Um, so after that um, overview, what I'm going to do is I'll hand over to Matt, who will give us a, a good look at the technical detail of the platform and get into a little more technical depth about what those capabilities look like. Um, so over to you, Matt. Thanks, James. Hi, everyone. So when we're talking about the concept of RPA, it, it's obviously very, very easy to get lost with what it really looks like. Um, but RPA really in a nutshell means getting some robot software to repeat any digital task uh, that a human does or could do. So for example, those common digital tasks could include things like logging into any application, so such as logging into SAP or Pronto uh, or any ERP system for that matter with its own robot username and password. Uh, as James alluded to, connecting to system APIs, which is the fancy way of interacting with systems uh, without using the user interface, so not needing to do things like mouse clicks or keyboard typing. Copying and pasting different data, uh, moving files and folders, uh, extracting and processing content from things like documents, PDFs, emails, uh, different forms. 
Um, that's particularly useful for situations where you're reading things like invoices, uh, quotes, and, and different forms. Uh, reading and writing to databases, opening and replying to emails. So for example, managing things like customer inquiries or forwarding emails to their appropriate recipients within the organization. Uh, scraping data from the web. So things like retrieving uh, price information and making complex calculations. So things like forecasting and probabilities. So when we talk about RPA, the invariable question is who is the main player? And according to Gartner, it is UiPath. Um, for those who don't know, the Gartner Magic Quadrant is the published result of some comprehensive research undertaken by Gartner in a, in a specific market. After evaluating the industry, the Magic Quadrant there shows how well each technology provider is executing in their stated visions. And as you can see in the RPA space, uh, UiPath is recognized as the leader. Um, this means that they're considered the best in class for RPA technology today and also in the immediate future as well. And, and this is a position they've been awarded for a few years now and really indicates uh, pretty much their standing within the, uh, the industry. In truth, though, that position is not really in doubt when you consider their reach. Um, they have over 4,000 staff, 10,000 customers and 5,000 partners. So they're, they're well and truly the, the global RPA business. Um, but it's not just that reach, it's also their very unique vision for the fully automated enterprise. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So what is the fully automated enterprise or, or really what does it look like? So it's, it's a situation where, first of all, all automatable work is assigned to robots, plain and simple. People are free to focus on more fulfilling, valuable and strategic work. Um, what's interesting about that is that staff still play an integral role in the so-called uh, fully automated enterprise. So their talents aren't, uh, and skills aren't lost or wasted. Uh, the automation is democratized and enables citizen developers. So in other words, automation becomes sort of self-propelling from within the business. And finally, AI is unleashed across every facet of work. Um, this is actually quite topical as uh, AI is pretty much now considered a, a business asset. And lots of businesses are already using AI at some level, you know, just for example, thinking about chat GPT and using that for quick answers on technical questions. So going forward, every business is going to need this asset to stay competitive uh, or else risk being left behind. Um, so I'll hand it back over to James now. Thank you. So obviously the technology is awesome and, you know, it can do all sorts of amazing things, but really you've got to be able to quantify what the benefits are to the business and actually understand what that impact is going to look like. So the first one is really about that ability to be productive around the clock. So robot, um, RPA robots will operate 24 seven. So unlike a human worker, there's no need to take breaks. So obviously any task that consumes like eight hours of the working day, if there's three days work, it can actually just work 24 hours and do all those three, day work, three days of work in one day. Um, and so you then can speed up your ability to complete tasks. So if you get things coming in outside of business hours, the robots will deal with them for the humans to then respond to in the morning. So there's a, that 24 seven ability is really kind of boosts the amount of productivity that your company can um, in, engage in. The other part is, another part is improved compliance outcome. So because um, robots are operating on a fixed process with their auditable set of rules, and it, it's very clear how they're doing things and they don't make mistakes because this, you know, they don't get tired, they're never going to copy and paste or type in the wrong number. Um, you get that much better compliance with both regulatory processes if you're bound by those or internal processes. If you've just got a particular way of doing things in your company and you want to make sure that they're stuck to, the robots will adhere to those because they don't they, 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 don't, say, they don't sort of have any capacity to vary from the, pro, the process that they're taught. In a very specific manufacturing context, context um, the ability to automate things like purchase orders and put, put, um, purchase requisitions means that you can really kind of stream, streamline that production management and get that real-time stock movement enabled. So you can really kind of optimize your supply chain and respond very, very quickly to changes in demands. The other piece is, is, I mean, it's a little bit of a technical benefit, but it doesn't disrupt any underlying system. So implementing RPA and driving the changes to automate your business does not require you to change a system because, you know, as we've talked to, they can engage with the front um, end systems as if they were a human worker. If the back ends are available, they'll communicate to those, but no configurate, and other than perhaps a little bit of configuration, there's no big system changes required to adopt these new processes. And of course, 
there's then the second sort of follow on benefit from that is that there's not a lot of upfront investment. In order to deploy a robot, you know, once you've got the robotic software in place, you don't have to go through anything as horrendous as an ERP migration to start improving your efficiency. You can get the robots to start delivering on that very quickly. And because these technologies are cloud-based, you can spin up extra capacity very quickly. So if you get a surge in demand, then you can dial that productivity up and start dealing with the surge in demand without any noticeable interruption to service. You're just literally throwing more people at it without the need to train them, without the need to onboard or hire them as well. Like you get talking about a human workforce. So the lead time to responding to changes in your business is a matter of minutes or hours rather than days or weeks. But there are also benefits to the human side of things. So it's not just a complete technology solution. There is a benefit that this is very useful for the human um, human workforce. So the key bit for what we found in deploying these solutions is that really it drives much better staff engagement because what you have is that all the administrative garbage that you have to do as part of your day-to-day -day job can be put aside to a robot. So the people can actually focus on the stuff that they really care about. So you know, in a customer service context, for example, there's no need to update CRM and file documents and deal with all of that. All the user, end user really needs to do is focus on actually talking to the customer. So if you're in a sales context, for example, that means not just taking details and processing and validating the order, but actually understanding the customer better and understanding what you can do better to serve them. The next part to that is also, um, next part is a, a about rapid innovation. So what you get is the capacity to um, really drive change because um, much more quickly, because you don't need to go through a big IT process to make any changes. If someone comes up with a bright idea about how to automate or improve a process, then they can actually start talking to the automation team and building that. Or even better, if they've been trained to be a citizen developer, they can start building a rough sketch of that work improving that process and then handing it over to a team to turn it into something industrial that will run 24 seven. So you start building that kind of business business led change in how you deal with your processes. It's not just an internal benefit, but it's also an external benefit. So what you do is you're improving your customer experience. Automated processes happen faster. It's more responsive. So if someone emails you for a quote and you've got that end to end process automated, then they'll get a response back in within minutes because the robot will just pick it up and deal with it. And you know, there's no queue, work queues or anyone else to consider. They can just jump on that immediately. And externally, because of the way that automation solutions can integrate with things like chatbots, you can have a chatbot on your website that actually plugs into your ordering systems and can actually start processing and responding to queries as they're actually required without actually needing to have a human um, customer service agent kind of respond to that requirement. So it's very, very broad um, um, benefits, both to the business generally, but also to the people that are actually working within the business. A lot of people are concerned that automation will take away their jobs. Generally, what we find is actually, all it really does is make people's jobs much more interesting and much more fulfilling. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Jane and we'll look at some actual use cases around where we've implemented this in practice. Yes, thanks, James. Um, so we're going to show you robots in action for two use cases for manufacturers. So firstly, let me tell you about the accounts payable automation solution. So this client is a national steel manufacturer and they wanted to automate their invoice processing to solve the issue of disparate accounts payable processes that they had across 60 sites, so quite a headache. The technology in-house is Pronto for their ERP and the Docflow, uh, and Docflow is their document management system. Now we were able to unify the accounts payable process using their existing systems and logic. So we were keeping things nice and, nice and straightforward, basically. The automation for this client has already saved accounts payable staff two days per week per site, and it's being rolled out to all 60 sites. We're probably about halfway through that now. So Matt, if you could show the video, please. Automated invoice processing. Our customer is sent invoices to an accounts payable email address. The robot monitors the inbox and processes each new email. Using machine learning, it reads the invoice to pick up details needed to process it, such as invoice number. The results are sent to a validation interface for a human to confirm the machine learning has worked as intended. The user validates the model's results. 
Any errors can be quickly corrected. This can be bypassed for cases where there is confidence in the model's accuracy. To close out the process, the robot then files the invoice in the document management system and sends the invoice data to the ERP via API for processing. This saves considerable time for the accounts payable team, as the robot reads, files and submits invoices for processing with no need for manual data entry or filing. So if, with that one that we just saw, um, what we what we mentioned beforehand, that automation in particular saved the AP staff roughly two days per week. Uh, but what made that particular implementation uh, as successful as it was, uh, was the real effort that we put into understanding the AP process clearly beforehand. So by mapping out that process really for the first time uh, on behalf of the business, we were able to uncover loads of existing inefficiencies, and we were also to come up. We were able to come up with some improved designs uh, that we could quickly resolve um, on behalf of the business and implement. Um, and then, basically, after we had that, roll that out as a proven solution across all of their sites. So that was really the backbone of the um, that particular uh, case study. Thanks, Matt. So the second case study, this is for a specialist parts manufacturer, and it's a pricing update automation solution. So like many manufacturers, our client had an inefficient price updating process for thousands of parts. The in-house tech is SAP for ERP, and our solution automated the price updating process end to end. So that there was the improved overall process. It improved the reliability and the speed, and it's so impressive that it's saving staff one day a week. One day a week. Also, the sales conversion has improved, and they're now using the most up-to-date prices for quoting at all times, which was not always the case. Sometimes they'd have out-of-date out information. So there's lots to look to like about this use case. Matt, can you show the next video? So with this particular one, what you'll see the robot doing is first retrieving a list of the items from SAP uh, via API requests. So nothing will happen on screen because it's all programmed. Um, but it, what it will also do is it will also open up the external uh, supplier price website and log in with its own credentials and then navigate within that site to the uh, item price lookup. And then once it's there, begin to loop through the list of parts that it retrieved from SAP. So it types in that particular part number, searches for that part, and then intelligently scrapes the data off the screen to locate the particular price information. And then once it has that price information, it will then add it back into SAP via an API to update that price, and then uh, move on to the next uh, price, uh, the next item and search for that item's price again in the external site. And then now that it's wrapped it up, it will actually send an email at the end of the process to a designated recipient with an attachment showing the results of that processing. That will include the item that was updated and also the pricing information and the status. As you can see there, you can see that those items uh, were updated. So again, uh, with this one, we focused in on trying to take the banal work out of staff hands. So we examined what the process was being done currently and then looked for ways to improve it. So in this case, it was about using the APIs, uh, which the business wasn't currently using. Um, so we were able to leverage that to send data into SAP instead of having to use clicks and types. And the end result was that the business now did not need to worry about their uh, prices in, in SAP at all, uh, because this, this uh, robot was able to automatically update and uh, keep track of pricing in SAP on behalf of the business. Um, so I'll hand over to James. So now we've seen those good examples about um, what the robots can do in practice. Um, what we want to do is just run through some of the points that you should bear in mind when thinking about, you know, how do we deploy this? How do we make this successful? Because it can be quite a big change within any company to start introducing this technology um, and it needs to be managed and thought through properly. Um, so there's a few points that we pulled out here. 
um, which kind of reference a McKinsey report from a few years back. So the first of these is that really you need to kind of avoid the siloed implementation. So this is this can be a whole of business change. So it, you know typically the operations will start in finance because it's one of those places where it's really easy to spot use cases. But automation as per UiPath's vision is part of being, building a fully automated enterprise. So there will be teams elsewhere in the business that are doing mundane work that can be pulled out and brought into that organization, um, into the automation process. So, you know, as Matt just sort of showed us, there's that pricing update thing, which is kind of a manual part of the sales process. It sits completely outside of finance. But because all teams in the company were involved in across it, we could start looking for opportunities elsewhere. And once the ideas start flowing as well, businesses will start cross, you know, cross pollinating ideas and, and building more capability. The second thing to think through is about being adaptable. And what that really means is that just because the way that the process is running now has been something that's been sat and agreed on for a long period of time doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to run things. So when you're bringing a robot in to start achieving things, um, or starting to deliver the process, the process can change because the robots can do things that perhaps would be more challenging or too time consuming for an individual human to do. So, you know, if they needed to do as part of a quote process, perhaps to go off and validate all of the pricing to make sure that it was accurate, that might take a long time for a human to do. A robot will be able to sit there, do that task and not be concerned about the length of time that it took because it would just tick through them and tick through them. So just kind of one of those key things that we do when we're designing the processes, we do start questioning, is this the right way to do things? Is this decision the right way to, to, to kind of approach and solve this particular problem? Now, the counterpoint to that is also you need to avoid what's called analysis paralysis, which is just you overanalyze and spend too much time thinking about everything that could be automated in the process. There's, there's definitely a benefit to just getting started and getting stuck in. So, and when Matt's talks about methodology, we'll get into that in more detail, but you know, we always run with a quick proof of concept to demonstrate to people the technology does deliver what it's capable of and to start people actually thinking about, you know, all right, now this is the way that things could change. This is the areas we could focus on, but not digging into that position where we just spend months and months analyzing a whole back backlog of processes before we do any work. We're trying to get, basically trying to drive impact to the business as quickly as possible. The other thing is to consider perhaps you know, slowing down to go fast, which is really just thinking about making sure that when you're implementing, you're very clear on what you're trying to do. So, you know, again, we'll cover this in the methodology, but it's like picking a small target, driving success for that, making sure that you understand the impact of automation on your business as you're going through that initial deployment allows for better outcomes later on because you're learning as an organization as you're putting this technology in and you need to start understanding the nuances and start generating those ideas. The next piece is then to look at scaling success. So a key part of delivery and the way that robots are built is that there's lots of components that can be reused. So, you know, it can be as simple as just to log on onto a particular system, but those components can be reused. And so as you start building out your capability within the organization, you're starting to actually build up this library of capabilities, little pieces of business processes that can be pulled together and rolled out to, rolled out to broader parts of the program. And as per our kind of customer that's operating their AP process, they're actually operating across 60 different sites. So what we've done is a controlled rollout that rolls it out, learns some lessons, makes the changes that are required before we start broadly expanding it more broadly. Because as with all technology implementations, if you try to go big bang and you fail, then you'll end up with egg on face, egg on your face, and, and people won't buy into it. So going slowly, rolling things out in a staged approach and learning as you go is very, very valuable. The other piece which also fits into our methodology is kind of formalizing the value. So part of anything we do is talking about what, you know, what's the ROI of a process? Where is the benefit coming from to the business for automating it? Sometimes it's really obvious because it can be something as mundane as well. You know, you will now free up one accounts person per, in your organization to do some additional work. And so the value of the ROI on that robot is the value of that employee's um, salary and overhead costs. Sometimes it can be in risk mitigation. So if by adhering, adhering to compliance better, you're reducing the cost of errors or you're perhaps reducing the cost of a regulatory breach, then that's a different factor that you need to bring in. And sometimes things are just done because the job, the job drives people crazy. It's just a mundane, boring part of their, their life. And if you get it off their plate, you'll have better employee engagement, you'll have lower staff turnover. And so there's, there's the, beyond the financial, there are other benefits that need to be considered. 
once you've got going, there's definitely value in building out a longer vision and going, well, well within our business, where is going to be the impact to this? Where are we going to drive this to drive the maximum impact for both cost savings, benefits to staff, impact to the organization, and also how your organization is going to operate? Because sometimes getting into the fully automated enterprise is actually looking at changing your business's operating model and going, actually, the way we do things now and the way things we want to do things when enabled by automation, when enabled by AI, AI is going to be very different. And you need to have that kind of forward thinking process. So um, with that, um, I'm going to hand over to Jane and we'll start running through on some really sort of practical components on actually how to make this work. Yes, thanks, James. So let's talk to how you can make automation work in your organisation. So my experience over the last three years, I mean, I've worked with a wide range of organisations and industries to get them automating business processes. And I love the fact that the te this tech can benefit any business. I've had the pleasure of helping councils, not for profits, um, educational institutions, pharmaceutical companies, private health insurers, government agencies and several manufacturers. And over time, we've been able to hone our offering to provide a compelling approach to back office process automation. So I wanna give you some tips on how you can make it work for you. The most important thing is to start small with a simple process. Just one that has just a few steps, minimal systems and stakeholders involved. So that keeps it a low cost and low risk. You don't wanna overreach and you don't want to under deliver. So it's so important to define the ROI and you'll see on the slide, there's a calculation formula, but also make sure that you factor in redeployment of your staff to more valuable work and that you understand how much robot time the process will take up. So you know what room you've got left on the robot um, for more processes that are going to come down the pipeline. I mean, that robot can work for you 24 seven. Finally, you wanna involve the business and you wanna get your subject matter experts involved as soon as possible. They will be key to the process discovery. They'll be key to buy-in within the team and also for use case prioritization. In my experience with the clients that I have, it's much easier to get budget allocated for a small POC, which once built is gonna quickly ignite the interest from the wider business. The SMEs evangelizing the benefits of automation will quickly result in a pipeline of processes that are ripe for automation with very little effort from the management, your staff are gonna bring their manual and repetitive, boring and tedious processes forward to you, trust me. Matt, can you take us through our EPIC methodology next, please? Yeah, so at Talos, uh, we practice our EPIC methodology to guarantee our delivery. So this is basically our standard approach to automation implementation for RPA and new starters. Um, also, you'll get a copy of this post event um, for reference. But in short, the EPIC methodology is broken into four parts. The first part is explore. So this is the first and most important step, um, really, of understanding the business processes. Uh, we generally workshop processes that could be automated and discuss things like ROI, um, profiles in candidacy, and risk management. The next step is P the prove. So here we uh, determine the applicability of the technology on a simple use case picked up from the earlier explore work. Um, this proof of concept will give some great insights into the technology, uh, the concept of automation within your business. Um, and at this point, things basically become clearer with regards to what RPA is, uh, what it looks like and how it works. The next one is integrate. So this is all about getting those RPA benefits quickly. So here we do things like uh, setting up the production infrastructure that integrates with your systems and, and really scaling the platform for enterprise governance and deployment. And finally, create. So here we basically embed automation across your business and, and take, undertake things like developing pipelines of work and process discovery for further automation opportunities. Thanks. So look, I hope this session has given you the desire to go into the business and look for some of those processes that are right for back office automation. Now we're gonna give you an RPA targets worksheet and this will help you to start evaluating potential RPA work within the business. When you've clocked up say half a dozen processes, we'd love to offer you a free half hour workshop. So we run these a lot with clients and basically, you know, we can 
bring expertise into the decision making on what process you're going to look at to do as a proof of concept. So keep that in mind. Our expertise can be invaluable at this point in ensuring that your proof of concept is a success. I think that's probably it. Um, feel free to reach out to James or myself at any time and we'll be glad to help you. And like I say, there's offers there of workshops or a strategy session with James. Um, and we do hope that you start to dig into those back office processes and look to automation to really take the business to the next level. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all.